Hi, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Graduate School of Architecture practice lecture series. And we're excited this evening to have um, Tanzim Razak and Althea Peacock joining us from their practice, Lemon Pebble, Johannesburg-based practice. And we're looking forward to hearing them share some of their work. Um, as many of you are aware, uh, this lecture is part of a series of lectures uh, that focus on practices. And what, we, what we've tried to do in the series is rather than invite practitioners simply just to come and show us their projects, which is the conventional uh, way of practices to present their work, we've invited practices to share some of their histories, to share some of their motivations, and to talk about how they practice, um, as well as showing some of their work, but showing us and explaining to us how they perform the work they do, how they practice, what their stories are, what their histories are, so that we have some deeper insight into the way that they work. This evening we have Tanzim and Althea. We've had some really fascinating presentations earlier in the series from Dixon Aduaje, a Ghanaian architect based here in South Africa, who was also a unit leader at the GSA. Kalisi Makubo, who's also teaching here at the GSA and has practice. Isabel Jolly Kerr presented last week from port au prince in Haiti. Althea and Tanzim this evening from Johannesburg. Next week we have Kate Otten, and then on the 3rd of October, uh, Vidal Dowding will be presenting the work of his practice, Atelier Vidal from Kingston, Jamaica. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, and during the course of the uh, presentation by Althea and Tanzim, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them into the chat. We'll be keeping track of them. And at the end of it, I'll be happy to share those questions with Althea and Tanzim. But of course, if you would like to pose the question directly, please just put your hand up and I will ask you to ask the question directly. I'm sure they'd be happy to respond to anything you might want to pose to them. Um, when I first visited uh, South Africa and visited the GSA at Leslie Locker's invitation, I met um, Tanzim and Althea at a variety of events, and uh, I've had the pleasure of visiting their practice and getting to know them. Um, they are a, a, a tour de force here in Johannesburg doing really venturous work, courageous work, and very beautiful work. Um, from their office, from their practice. Um, they forged a friendship uh, as students at Wits University in the early 90s. And after they graduated in 2006, they formed Lemon Pebble. And as they, as they say, from, their, from the outset, their work took a fluid collaborative approach um, that incorporated uh, not just their preoccupations and interests, but also their personal histories and identities. Uh, Lemon Pebble's work seeks to create inspiring spaces grounded in efficiency, it's considerate of the past, and it also looks forward to a reimagined future. They work across scales, from the macro-urban design to the design of public and social infrastructures with transformative agendas. And both Althea and Tanzim are involved in, involved in academia and research through teaching and examining, which informs their practice. Althea is actually this year an external examiner at the GSA, and Tanzim has served in a number of capacities, as both of them have as uh, visiting critics. Um, but Tanzim has also been a moderator here, so they've, they've been keen supporters and, a, and an important part of the GSA. Um, they describe their work as operating at the confluence of critical spatial thinking and contested landscapes landscapes, erased identities, and spatial justice, all intrinsic components of their practice. So I'm going to remove myself from the spotlight and hand you over to Tanzim and Althea, and uh, we look forward to their presentation. Okay, thanks again, Mark, for the very kind and generous introduction and for giving us this platform to speak. Um, my name is, as you've heard, Althea Peacock, um, so welcome and good evening to everyone joining us today. Um, and I'm Tanzim Razak. Um, the story of Lemon Pebble starts really in 2006, after having completed my master's in urban design, working on my own for two years as a sole practitioner with a smaller residential project. I finally won a tender uh, to survey a very large uh, hospital. With this opportunity, I asked my friend Althea to partner up, and so Lemon Pebble was born. And so while we may have understood design and the technical part of buildings, at the time, we knew nothing about running a business. We had no networks or support structures. And the idea of cash flow or profitability of a business or how to do our taxes completely eluded us. But what we did know is that we wanted to explore our own ideas. What's in a name? 
we've often asked what's the name of where the name Lemon Pebble came from. And we wanted actually cherries, which is a slang alluding to the idea of two women coming from the townships. But all the cherries were taken in the, in the uh, company registration processes. So we proceeded to put fruits together and the Lemon Pebble design came into being. The name has since literally grown on us. What was clear from the outset was that we didn't want the traditional naming of the firm with our surnames, and we wanted to differentiate ourselves from the traditional practices. So we initially started with Lemon Pebble Design, which later, later evolved into Lemon Pebble Architects. And, and this happened while we were on an entrepreneurial program in order to make up for our lack of business acumen, where we were very rightly advised that it's good practice to put what you do into the, into the, uh, into the name of the practice itself. And then as we evolved and grew, increasing our capacity and our skills, the name changed to Lemon Pebble Architects and Urban Design. And here we are. Um, so as Mark has introduced us, we're really going to be expanding on what he has, um, how he has introduced us. Our talk this evening is both a reflection on the joys and pains of our practice um, and a chance to share some of our journey with you. The image on your screen is a map which geographically locates Tanzim and myself. Um, so Tanzim is on the far east, right here in Benoni, and I was somewhere here in Rivoli um, between Johannesburg and Rodeburg. We are located within sites which were planned for perpetual marginalization, exclusion, and segregation. Despite the apartheid planning model intended to divide and rule, we managed to grow up in communities which nurtured and gave us a place to belong. So these two people in front of you, um, one from the far east of the mining belt and one sort of on the western end, uh, gained a particular perspective and understanding of the city. Then in the early 1990s, as you've heard, before probably some of you were born, uh, and when South Africa was on the cusp of democracy, Tanzim and I met on the first day of our first year um, in the culture shock that was the architecture school of it. We introduced ourselves to each other um, while we were leaving, I think the third or fifth pub crawl, which was an initiation that was happening on campus and in, into which we clearly didn't fit. But who knew years later, after graduating and separately working for several prominent architects, that we would be celebrating our 17th year of practice in that same landscape. As a radical standpoint, perspective, position, the politics of location necessarily calls those of us who would participate in the formation of countercultural practice to identify the spaces where we begin that process of revision. For us, this quote means centering ourselves as black women architects and positioning ourselves as taking a radical standpoint in some ways. So designing Lemon Pebble. The building of a practice is a deliberate act of design. And even as young architects, we knew the type of practice we wanted to have, one which reflected ourselves, our own ideas and our own identities. So we're located in Newtown, uh, which was the historic Indian location called by a more derogatory term, as you see on the map, which was the norm in the early 1900s. The area is renowned as a place where Gandhi led the resistance for the fights against the past laws. It was also the home to the locations of the blacks, Malays, and Indians who suffered Indian bubonic plague in the area, as well as the Spanish flu. And our particular site was a location of a temporary plague hospital. So overlaid on this map is a contemporary map of Johannesburg uh, with the building of the highway. And you can see this big line across here, if I'm right off here, um, uh, that made for the large scale industrial buildings of the area right now. It also saw the erasure of the locations in the first round of forced removals. So for us, locating ourselves in Newtown brings us a full circle. Here, what is an abstraction and overlay of the maps of the past and present it acknowledges the ridge, which is this line here, a fault line, a di divider between the rich in the north and the poor in the south, the resource in the north and an undersea resource in the south, the green north and the dusty south. Mapped out here are highlighting some of the areas we're working in the northern suburbs as well as the inner city of Johannesburg. And here on the yellow dot, the stink yellow dot is where we are right now. For its understanding, mapped out here is highlighting some errors. For us, it's understanding the past, reclaiming the present, and reimagining a future. Locating us in the inner city, where clients are still hesitant, or some of them even refuse to visit us. 
As Tanzine has noted, when we started our practice, we were quite deliberate about where we wanted our practice to be. There is a sort of collectivity to being located in the city. This is part of our practice ethos and extends to how we physically made the space in which we work. It was a combination of using reclaimed and recycled, recyclable materials, which we sourced from neighbors and from clients, and was constructed with the skills and patience of artisans and craftsmen whom we formed a relationship with and worked with over the years. As a comment on our practice values, we always acknowledge how critical our team is to making our practice and business work. In our intentionally diverse practice, we have seen many people come and go over the years. Some have grown in their own capacities as architects, others have followed very different paths, but they all have left a lasting impression on us. This also informs how we bring new team members on board. We have, shared, we have a shared value system and can therefore build on what their predecessors have contributed. So even as we approach a second decade of practice, we, dis we are, remain a distinct minority. Stats from SACEP, which is the South African Council of Professional, um, Professional Architects, in 2022 revealed that the professional architect category, there are 4,165 architects, which excludes the other categories of technicians, senior technicians, and draftsmen. Of that, uh, 1,195 are female architects, sitting at about 28.6%. 28.6%. Whilst this may seem promising um, in the new and post-apartheid era, the current population stats put women at 51%, and that puts us far from representation. And more concerning and worrying, though, is that previously disadvantaged women form even a smaller minority at 200 and only 211 architects at only 5%. And that includes all the black women, Asian women, and colored women. So let's just deal with the elephant in the room from the outset. The, rel the relative for us, or even though um, owning our own practices, defining it, and creating agency for ourselves, we do not escape the aggression that face people of color and women in construction daily. Token, angry black woman, that woman, thy fro. Those are some of the terms that are regularly um, uh, leveled at us. So being a black female minority in a male dominated industry, we have to constantly validate our competency and expertise. So Tony, Tony Morrison says, um, the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It also keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. None of this is necessary there will always be one more thing. And we have always taken that to heart. So we just get on with the job. So the idea for us, the question for us really in our practice is how do we bring particular insight to the areas that we work in, coming from the townships and having lived in the, having the lived experience that we have? So Neville Alexander, an anti-apartheid activist, um, academic um, and writer, said that st the strategic, pol political and ultimately Model historical question is how to move towards understanding without ever forgetting, but to remember without constantly rekindling the past. This is a very old project of uh, almost 13 years old where we worked in collaboration with Kate Otten Architects. Number three, Katza is a derelict building, an, an, an original of want of a way for want of a better world, native hostel in Johannesburg, one of two remaining in Johannesburg. The team was appointed to rehabilitate it rehabilitate the building as transitional housing for the Johannesburg Development Agency as a client of the, uh, as an agent for the Department of Social Development. So transitional housing is a limited period housing that provided for, for people themselves without accommodation while looking for a more permanent place to live. It's a very utilitarian building and the building is located on Cotsa Street in Brompentain, directly opposite uh, directly opposite the woman's jail, it's located around here, directly opposite the woman's jail, uh, and in front of that is the, con and the constitutional hill precinct. Um, this building housed single black male medical workers in atrocious conditions, in almost inhumane conditions, as you point out, concrete bunks, um, uh, open showers, uh, no privacy for, for ablutions, etc. Um, so the question remained for us, how do you make this painful history physically evident in buildings without reinstating the status quo? Okay, sorry. So in this building, the most evident reminder of apartheid era special injustice was the lack of a front door. 
The building faced the street, uh, but despite that, the inhabitants were forced to access the building through the deliberately created back entrance, as you can see in this original, um, the original entrance here. So what we tried to do was to restore the idea of dignity, which was previously stripped from the occupants by the creation of a deliberate urban front door, and thereby inverting the previous power relations. This was done by mark clearly marking all the new work as green, so that transformation was made clearly uh, legible by ro literally rolling out a green carpet. And this does include other spaces that were uh, now the creation of privacy in the bathroom by adding doors, lengthening other doors, and creating privacy barriers where, where there were none, as you can see in these images before. And finally, creating that green carpet that extended into the city itself. So we, we find that we are working where most architects don't work or shouldn't work or supposedly are not meant to be working. Most of us are quite familiar with this image and the inequities it represents. In our work, we find ourselves engaging in both sides of this coin. We have worked in Waterfall Estate, a wealthy gated enclave to the north of the city, which sat, sits on 22,000 hectares of land as 27 kilometers of boundary wall uses 45 billion rands worth of infrastructure and acts as a self-governing privatized city. And yes, we have private house clients whose homes are Instagrammable. However, we are simultaneously concerned with and aware of how our skills and agency could be used more effectively to benefit more people who do not have access to the same resources where there are unhoused pe people living in so-called informality. We are conscious of the unbalanced focus of attention and resources away from the city center to enclaves of, priv of privilege and how this manifests when we see consistently visible headlines. In our 2017 GSA talk, we included this slide. The same headlines are even more applicable, more widely applicable now. So, as Ivana said, the challenge of architecture is to be capable of departing from outside of architecture in the environment of ambiguous problems that matter to society. This image was taken almost 10 years ago in a building we were surveying, and this resonated strongly as it did then, more so after the tragedy of the inner city two weeks ago. The issue of desperate need for housing has never been greater or more urgent and the realization that the needy complete, uh, continue to be exploited. Yet housing models and typologies continue to follow models reminiscent of the apartheid area like the RDP housing of currently being there. So within the inner city itself, um, we renovated two buildings in Berea years ago, uh, renovating over 400 units with a Tuft housing agency. We created um, alternative layouts that included communal housing as well as various individual units, as we can see on the, on the image right here. However, even done within the regulations, within with city entities that tested new typology, things go bad. This building was, hi was hijacked within two years. Fortunately, though, it was reclaimed after months. However, for us, it was a cold realization that there are limitations from what architects can actually do. So within all of these, what are our options? Given the historic precedents we were raised in and are now challenged with dismantling, is there a formula for shifting this, this inherited landscape? How do we begin? For us, it is being conscious of social, political, economic, historic, and the demographic context. But it is by reinscribing what it means to be at home in the city, whatever way your family unit is constituted. It includes having conversations with residents, thinking about opportunities like activating the ground floor with small scale commercial programming to sustain a different urban condition in a gentrifying neighborhood. It is being conscious of the slow bureaucratic policies and people who prefer continuing apartheid residential typologies of single gender hostile accommodation. And it is in designing in opposition to that, to make more appropriate spaces, which consider families and safe spaces for women, 
even if it does land you in the office of the director of public works and being accused by the client PM of trying to enrich yourself or creating better living conditions. It is about meeting developers who buy into the notion of variety and that living in the city on its edges does not exclude making public space to build social cohesion and who agree that townships could be at the forefront of such de developments with diversified and more sustainable tenancy. That we consider historical attitudes to prime property in contested spaces and design for access to decent housing and employment and not merely profit. In privilege and exclusionary contexts like the speculative project in Cape Town. Okay, difficult days. The majority of our work is within the public sector. We access work through the tender process and working within this public center brings its own challenges. But despite our uh, training as designers, 80% of our work is just management, people management and contract management. We have to work through a minefield of issues, construction mafia, protest that closes our sites, having multiple stakeholders with differing interests, budgets that need to be met within limited time frames, and the list continues. One particular project, a police station in Kwamklanga, a public works project, stretched the limits of how difficult it could get. These are some of the headlines that was in the media nationally. A particular developer linked to a project of national interest made claims of non-payment to the Department of Public Works, amongst other things. The dispute went all the way to the High Court. And the only thing that saved us as the principal agent was meticulous minute-taking and a site direct diary that documented all the threats, intimidation, aggression on site that is not normally, normally part of the management process. Words like, the contractor was aggressive, contractor is threatening, were regular part of the minutes. The High Court battle was based on our documentation and the project was finally completed. However, it didn't end there. 12 years later, we were called to the project public protector's office when the contractor uh, resurrected his claims. So most files are just kept there for five years and then discarded legally. But with good filing again and good archiving, it allowed us to defend the case again without having to even access our uh, professional indemnity. So lessons learned for us, a good filing system, document everything, and when you see, start to see things go pear shapes, as they sometimes will. As you can see, much of the work that architects do exists outside of the design process. And as a result, the difficult days always prompt us to re-examine our role as architects. We are spatial translators, facilitators, and social and spatial mediators. All of those roles were put to test in our Newtown urban, develop urban development framework, which for me required a kind of shifting of gears and a realization that there was a lot more that I didn't know. There is also needed to be a shift in critically reviewing one's design process. It is seldom a neat linear process. It is more like sifting through multiple threads before arriving at something coherent. The actual UDF process requires very deliberate strategies but also collaborative interactions and workshops with multiple stakeholders who are residents, business owners, or city officials. We had meetings with business owners and government department stakeholders. We also had meetings with residents. This was our first community engagement and it was a complete failure. The assumption that was that we had come with a complete design and plan and were only coming to present it as a courtesy. People were very angry and they didn't want to hear what we had to say. One gentleman stood up and told us that they were not interested in listening to what Lemon Watt Watt had to say because they, were, they wanted people from the area involved in the project. We didn't get a chance to tell them that actually our office is a stakeholder in the area. The ward councillor mobilized the crowd and they walked out. In our intention to speak with everyone affected by the project, we also visited Bekizela, an informal housing development across the road from our office. Here, our architectural and spatial language was pulled unceremoniously off its high horse. I drew an X on the aerial photo to indicate what I thought would be clearly understood as a simple marker to locate where this place sat 
in relation to the larger precinct. Instead, to the residents here who are already living in extreme precarity, it represented demolition and erasure. More hard lessons for the privilege of our so-called agency. The day was saved by our community liaison who explained my mistake and cleared the air for us to continue the meeting. We continued our engagements by creating spaces and platforms for the remainder of our planned community engagements. To get through the history, needs, wants, threats, opportunities, problems, ideas, and potential which people brought to us. Ultimately, the project became about confronting and defining the concept of difference expressed in the evidence, spatial and social disconnections the multiple layers of history, exclusions, infrastructures, policies, identities, and demographics, all of which informed and shifted the design process and eventual outcomes. I say eventual outcomes knowing the background that there was a final revision and also a final, final revision and an actual version and a computer crashing. And yes, I know there are AutoCAD icons, but the Revit and the Photoshop and whatever software crashed on the day as happens in anywhere. Through all of these activities, we gain insights into our own processes, which then informs the next project. And eventually leads to something we can present to the client, along with multiple detailed reports and projections. And that fairy tale of clean linear process we are meant to follow is really a lot more organic and seemingly chaotic with last minute changes, client inputs at weird stages, scary fee quotes to the client, extended deadlines, multiple revisions, sleepless nights and panic attacks. We rinse and repeat for the next project in a slightly different arrangement. So how we, we work in drawing. Um, in this project, we won a tender to rationalize an existing early childhood development to create a typology that was more building, buildable for emerging contractors. Um, here I present a series of images and outlining our design and drawing processes. These are the planning of the existing typology that is rationalized uh, through massing models uh, to create simpler spaces and forms. You can see hand sketches of plans evolving from to, uh, to give the client various options while in the meeting itself so that we can, we can speed up the process. And finally, it evolves into a presentable sketch plans with the idea starting to become real of wayfinding and including each um, office with its own color and starting to allude to a form that might become real. Then uh, a, a site plan for a, a typical site that might, uh, yeah, that might be included. And then the drawing of a, a drawing and materiality of a boundary wall to convince the client to deviate from the norms and standards of a basic clear view of fence to create a distinct identity in the project. And having finally convinced them, you see it in its built form. This is a sketch of an early sketch of uh, designing with the client of how a child could possibly engage in a, uh, a in a classroom itself to lower the to lower the basins, make it more accessible, the use of color to create like fine, tiny peepholes and windows so that the parents can peep into a room without disturbing the class, to change, to create soft surfaces, and then working out the areas so that we can comply with the very stringent OHS uh, requirements. And here we see another series of drawings about uh, using of color and about color using as wayfinding into the project and the reality of how it occurs. A render, an early render to convince the client to go with the licorice, um, all sorts kind of color palette that was required, or that we envisioned, and finally the public space as it uh, as it emerges. In early sketches of how we imagine the uh, play areas to be, and then how it finally becomes uh, in reality with its uh, climbing fence, internal slides, and astroturf. 
um, uh, for some of the some of the um, uh, rational or security requirements means for a very hard space for a child. We try to um, convince the client to soften that by creating the burglar bars that become um, abacuses and building blocks, as well as to rethink what um, uh, surfaces might be for a child by using play balls within polycarp sheeting um, that will give it a sense of playfulness, as well as uh, on your right hand side, um, seeing how we can use a pixelation and images from the area itself so that the ch that's, uh, that ch children are not only ex um, exposed to designified images. And an early sketch, um, uh, sketch up render, and then the, the final, a year later, the, the realization of the building. Collaboration, as we've spoken about before, forms a large part of how we work and how we continue to expand our network and enrich our work. This alternate method of practice allows us to extend these relationships that we have built over several years with friends and other industry colleagues. Functionally, it presents us with some fluidity to expand and contract our capacity, but also widens the pool of ideas and expertise we can bring to a project. So this project done on Wits University was a project done in collaboration with SRS architects and, and they were designing within the university context. The questions we asked ourselves, how do we design university buildings in this post-apartheid uh, era and a roads and a roads must post roads must fall era? How do you take into account um, the demanding voices that want to be heard and rightly so? We, did, we used this through, a, we went through a participatory, and the word always makes <laughs> me, methods previously used in Newtown that allowed us to engage with the users, not only the academic staff, but students, support staff, and the cleaning staff as well. And through a series of uh, mappings and questionnaires, um, a process was undertaken, and which finally, where the results were, were collated, um, resulting in a brief that had buy-in from all. So this project is actually a creation of a new link building to two schools, um, the School of Architecture and Planning, as well as the School of uh, Construction and Economic Management. And the idea was to rationalize a very complex circulation and, con and, um, and to connect multiple levels. And the vision was uh, to break the silo between individual buildings as well as the schools themselves. Uh, we use again. We use a method, a very basic of massing, and then using color to get legibility and create uh, um, uh, not only buy-in but understanding of everybody within the process of how this is will be done. Um, these are highlighting the demolitions that we done, um, the the new 24-hour building that will be created through various massings, and then using again our color palette of how do we connect the multiple complex levels, and then using this as a vignette or template. Um, that is put on every single drawing so that it's understandable by all, uh, thereby simplifying this very, very complex levels. And here, yeah, a very uh, simplistic uh, uh, vignette of the way we work. We, so we, we work between the extremes of analog and digital with a very basic tool of a pencil in order, in this case, to uh, work out the structural grid and the lighting, the structural and, and lighting grid, as well as the ventilation and uh, the ventilation, the, the, the ventilation and smoke detection and how what what how what air would rise. And at the moment, this project is under construction. How does it become in, uh, into reality? Reality. And finally, one of the final things, we're very excited that for the first time, outside giving talks, um, that we were participants, uh, we were engaging in a global context as participants at the Venice Biennale this year. Um, our project, uh, working in collaboration with a dear friend from Office 24-7, showcased our exhibition, Drawing Memory into Being at the Venice Biennale this year. This project will be a lecture on another platform in the upcoming weeks. But what the Venice Biennale gave us was the confidence that ideas from Africa are completely relevant, innovative, innovative and we have an innate understanding of issues that, that, that facing the globe today. And as Africans, we can not only make a meaningful uh, contribution, but we can be leading on the issues themselves. So our practice is about perspective beyond building. Practicing architecture is not only about the building. We think and write about our work and the things affecting our work and affected by our work. It is also about the activities adjacent to our work, the celebrations and playfulness, which is part of our, part of our office culture. It is also about the opportunities which emerge from seeing another work stage in our process 
which comes from research. For each, each of us, there are slightly different readings of what this means. For Tanzin, it's stage zero, which frames the research undertaken before a project really begins and becomes real data. For me, it is the unnamed work stage of reflection and unraveling in and through that research. In both instances, it leverages our work and our personal and historical narratives. So we've taken you along on our own journey towards making architecture with our own interests. But you will have your own journey. And what we've learned is that whatever we create has an impact on the environment and for people for years to come. And although for us this has not always been an easy journey, but if done with purpose, responsibility and imagination and for the right purposes, architecture can really, really matter. But thank you so much. Uh, Tanzim, and uh, that was a really uh, insightful um, view and perspective into your practice. Thank you very much, and, and lots of people clapping with the clapping emojis. So thank you so much. That was really, really a very engaging presentation. Um, so what we'd like to do now is to just open the floor um, to any questions. If any, if you'd like to raise your hand and um, put a question directly to Tanzim and Althea. Or if you would like to just put something in the chat, I'm ha also happy to, to pose the question to you, whatever you feel comfortable. But I'm sure there's lots of there are lots of thoughts or reflections on your work. But I'd, I'd like to start off with a question, and I, and I would like to know um, in your practice, it seems like you've you know you've achieved a great deal. Um, but what would you say has been the biggest challenge to you in in, in the course of your practice since 2006? Realizing the impact that our work has has been uh, something that I think we, we struggle with and, and it doesn't seem a lesson, we always argue about this, but we, we do have, I definitely do have confidence issues and, and centering our work um, and centering ourselves in the conversation about what architecture means, how it's taught, um, how it's practiced, all of those kind of dynamics are part of the reality of our practice and it, it has been a journey from when we started to realize how important those those dynamics are in thinking about our work and, and going forward even in our collaborations the, the conversations come up continuously about why we work the way we do it um, so yeah i'm not sure if that answers the question yeah, I think for me, it's like Althea said, it's about confidence, but confidence is only gained once you put yourself out there and you create and, and you make yourself vulnerable. And the vulnerability is part of saying that my ideas matter. And it's taken us, um, I know for young practitioners or our graduates out there, um, that self-belief is something that you build on. And we come from a generation that our self-belief was eroded, but you are lucky enough to be in a in a, in a space that Believe in yourself, in your particular ideas, because they have value. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. It's taken us a very long time to do that. Um, and that's the biggest lesson for myself, is to be vulnerable, to go out there. Your ideas matter. They might not be the right ideas, but architecture is about working through it, engaging with others so that you can build on ideas. And that is the long, the lessons that's taken many years to learn. Thank you. And, and there's a, there's a, Kennedy has a hand up. Kennedy, if you'd like to go ahead and unmic and ask your question. All right. Awesome. Thank you so, so much for the beautiful lecture this evening. I uh, really appreciate it. I'm loving your work. Um, <clears throat> the question that I have is just what advice would you give um, from someone who wants to start his own architectural practice? Would you, would you recommend um, more collaborations? Or would you recommend me uh, starting a particular basis point? So what kind of advice would you give to someone once you do that? One, for me, it's a very pragmatic advice. Um, yes. Is that get your finances right from the beginning. So if you have if you have a family member who can be your accountant, yeah. um, having your finances, understanding what is cash flow, what is profitability or projecting it that, and also having your taxes in place, all yes. of those pragmatic things and understanding the numbers. So you can be the most creative person in the world, but if it's not viable and feasible, um, yes. then your practice is going to flounder. Uh, um, and so... 
the, the fact that we had a, a, an accountant of a, a family member that assisted us in keeping clean books um, meant that we could that we could tender quite early, which is the majority of our source of work. So because tender tenders are um, uh, documentation heavy, but if you have the basics in place, don't ignore contracts. Don't ignore um, uh, contracts between you and your client. Don't ignore the documentation. It saves, as we pointed out to you, it saved us from the highest courts in the land. Um, so that would be my advice to you. When the builder tells you, "Ah, this is it's a small business. I don't want minutes or I don't want notes." Ignore him, just carry on, do what you have to do. Because if it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. As you as you younger people know, if it's not in on Instagram, it didn't happen. Here in contract, if it didn't, if it didn't write, if it's not in writing, it didn't exist. And I, I think I would just add to that, it, it is um, maybe a, kind of an indictment on some of the education that many people are getting in other schools nationally, that we don't get taught that business acumen. So I think do your homework about the kind of practice that you want to establish. Um, I think we we also were really fortunate in finding that we have a partnership that works and it's not always roses and petals and uh, rose tinted glasses. But I think if you find um, a group of people that you can collaborate with, that it makes the journey easier. Um, I know a lot of our, our friends who are sole practitioners, they'll call us just to whine about something because it's some someone else to bounce an idea off of or share frustration. Or if you don't know how to deal with a particular situation, it's useful having someone else to bounce your thinking off of. Um, so form those relationships, but also the people that you currently know are your network. Mm -hmm. So build those networks within your, your faculty, outside of your faculty, all your peers in similar in the similar field of the construction industry, all those people are your connections, they are your network. So make sure that you try and reach out to those people, learn who they are, um, so that it, it helps you develop uh, your, your brand and the way your company may or may not function in the future. Thanks for that. Uh, Alki and Tanzim. A couple comments um, from Sanjay. He said, I enjoyed that you both acknowledged challenges that you faced and were honest that you didn't know how the practice came into being and how it transformed, but you embraced the journey as it and you evolved. It's, it's exceptionally inspiring for us young entrepreneurs. And the other thing is um, great and honest presentation, ladies. This is from Wiz. Um, great and honest presentation, ladies. What challenges did you face during COVID? And what was your approach to overcome this? COVID was rough. <laughs> um, I think we, you know, one of the, the biggest kind of blows, and, and we weren't the only people that felt it, is it impacted our bottom line. Um, it impacted the health of our practice. It impacted um, how many people were in our practice, it impacted the work that we got, the projects, the cost of projects, the cost of materials, all of those things kind of had a snowballing effect. Um, so it, COVID was uh, a very difficult year, um, but we, we managed to work within that time. Uh, the team that we have, and, and we keep referring to how much we depend on our team. With, without our team, we, we don't have a business. Um, they, they carried us through. Uh, we worked remotely. We managed to find ways to, when we needed to meet, we, we found ways of doing those things. Um, and as soon as we were allowed as a, a critical business, because the construction industry was at some point um, categorized as critical, we were back in the office. So we, we found a hybrid way of working in the beginning and as soon as we could be fully back in the office we were um, but it did take mental strain on on our team um, we, we 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 suffered kind of kind of emotional uh, stresses throughout that time so it, it was difficult in in that isolation in the uncertainty in the loss of the connections between people because we were so 
deeply connected when whoever we're working with, whether you're on site or whether you're having meetings, all of those relationships shifted because we were now removed from each other. So things were, were very challenging. But there was a there was one thing that was a positivity too. Um, so I think previously we recognized that we actually worked in a quite a rigid way in terms of time. Um, so have, we try to always run a practice where it's it's eight to five uh, because that thing that outside work unless it's unless it's a major deadline we try to keep that like we don't contact our our employees and our team after hours because we think that having a life outside architecture feeds into creativity and we experienced that at youngsters and so we wanted our practice to to be however so we kept within the nine to five thing and any any possibility of remote working or alternative ways of working was refused from our end to when our staff made appeals post covid we see it completely differently um we have one staff member that works in, in another country um uh, alternative months and someone who doesn't um or others uh, other staff members who can't make it in per day we have flexibility but it's also about the level of trust so it cannot be done expansively but we have to have uh, we have to shift some of we have to be a little bit more fluid understand that as a smaller practice we did have a little flexibility and we use that but it also means that some mind shifts from our own end which were quite rigid at the time that that, that wasn't working and that we are entering the new era hybrid working has saved us time in terms of office meeting unnecessary time so the value of time has become even more more, more important no thank you that, that's really valuable and uh, nice to pivot the conversation around covid to the lessons learned from it i think really valuable um, and we have a question from Ruby. Ruby, you'd like to go ahead and, and ask a question. But before you do, just an apology. That last question from Bill, not Wiz. Um, sorry about that, Bill. But Ruby, over to you. All right. Thanks, Mark. And hi, Althea. Thank you, Althea and Tenzin, for your presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. It was, it was quite honest and refreshing. Um, and also just your history. Um, we're really not aware of the challenges you face. So it was quite an eye opener to see that. Um, so the both of you seem to be quite gracious and you sort of like have a position of humility the way you articulate yourselves and but you've also had to deal with stereotyping racism um, just a certain expectation based on your physical attributes and your backgrounds and you spoke about having to deal with 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 aggression from contractors and the community and you know since this is a male ma male dominated field um there is a certain sort of authority that male males carry when they speak sort of unapologetically um and i had wondered as as females the the graciousness that you have is that an attack is that intentional to respond do you intentionally respond with uh, being this gracious to aggression um, or is that something you've had to learn over the years? Um, yeah, or have you grown into it? Or is that just your characters? I think we have a very different ways of, of, of responding. Um, my younger self um, always got extremely angry um, and built up this tension and wanted to deal with every situation on an equal thing. Mm. But I've learned as I grow older that to pick your fights. Mm. And then the more we talk about it and expose it, um, the, our experiences, and they might come in terms of my, everyone has a different reading of it, but I realized that that we need to, that you have to pick your battles. Mm. And that as we, our agency grew, that we needed to be sitting on positions where we can influence change um, rather than just responding to somebody else's perception of who we are or our capabilities. And therein we try to make sure that we start to sit in bodies where who make decisions. Um, uh, yeah, and within there to understand the gaps of how people are treated and to say to, to use our experiences to, to motivate for other ways of, of working. The reality 
diversity, I think we're in a better position than most other countries where sometimes the racism or the stereotyping or the biases are underlying. And so you start to question yourself, like, did I experience that? Oh, is my lived experience enough? Oh, like, um, do I have experience enough? Is, is my ideas valued? Whereas here, you can start to speak about it a lot more. And I think that's given us a lot. For me, I, I think speaking about it and say, this is how I feel and this is valid and this is how I experience the situation. Mm. Um, I have brought it up in conversations where it's gone beyond the line um, and it's led to change in, 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 in codes of conduct, in public meetings. I've sat in public meetings, in uh-huh. public forums, giving presentation, and we called that woman. Um, and not responding immediately, but then bringing it up afterwards. So um, just choose your path where you can influence. That's my perspective. Althea has a different, a different because we personality wise very different. Yeah. Um, thanks for the question, Ruby. And I think it's 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 never easy. And often we think because we've been in practice for so long that things would shift, that things have changed. Um, but just this week, just last week. We are faced with people who question our uh, integrity, they question our authority, they question our capability, Mm. and in very, very subtle ways. And I think it's it's easy to respond in anger. Mm. Uh, And we, I think if we do respond in anger, for me, it will always be justified. But we also are aware of the place where we sit. So if we respond in anger, that then cements the stereotype that, oh, this woman is always going to react in this way. You are an angry woman, so that's how you're going to react. So it is about picking your battles. And Mm. I I very lightly quipped about being called into the director's office at Public Works. That was a confrontation that could have been handled in a very different way, but we chose diplomacy. We chose to shake the hand of the offender and make nice so that we can continue with the relationship, continue with the client and show that we are willing to negotiate that space. Mm. Um, Unfortunately unfortunately for me, I always find that it's a negotiated space, Um, but it is something that you learn over time. Um, And sometimes I've been accused by some of my project managers of being too soft and too nice. So sometimes it does bite you for being so um, tolerant, uh, but we have to find other ways of working. And I find people are more willing to speak to me because I'm listening to them mm. instead of the aggression that you find when there are only men in the room. Mm. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, and thanks for the question. Um, prompt, Ruby. Um, a couple of, I'm just going to read out a couple of the comments and then we can move on to one or two more of the questions. Um, Kennedy, who asked a question earlier, said, thank you very much, wonderful lecture. And Bill, who asked the question about COVID, said, great, thanks for sharing your experience. And Abiola Akinladi says, congratulations on the longevity of your partnership and your practice. Uh, Lynette Harding, great lecture and presentation, thank you for sharing. Um, Christine says, being challenged as being that woman is not a racial issue, but a gender attitude. I experience that often. And Lone Paulson says, your success and approach to architecture comes as no surprise to me, given your openness to ideas and challenges, both as students and as practitioners and as teachers. Well done, and may you grow from strength to strength and continue to inspire others. So now back to some questions. Oh, and then sorry, um, one from Finzi. Great work and congratulations to you two. I want to thank you for your informal mentoring that you give to many of our students that are sent your way from us. May the lemons and pebbles keep you forever young. Thanks for that sentiment, Finzi. Um, now back to some questions. Um, uh, Kimal is asking, how do you balance the need to be profitable with your commitment to social justice? It's a complete challenge. Um, wh- what we realize is that they, not every project, um, what not every project is the ideal project for to deal with the issues that interest you. So there are projects where Althea had pointed out that we worked in waterfall um, and there are some really concerns 
concerning restrictions that are exclusionary in terms of places like that. So sometimes you have to deal with the client. So we, can, we have a choice in choosing the client, but not deal with the bigger issue. But at the same time, in so we've lost jobs. Let me be straight up. We've lost jobs by by challenging briefs or talking about the inadequacies of certain uh, or, or certain norms and, and standards. And saying now that out loudly has lost us um, several major projects in the past. With hindsight, I think there was a different way of dealing with it. And I found that rather than talking about the issues, because designers, we are, it's a very powerful position to bring in those issues quietly um, in the design to add a spaza shop or to um, a challenge, a brief, and put it as a position of um, change and innovation, so changing our language in order to see from the client's perspective in terms of efficiency um, uh, uh, and how it will benefit them is a way of negotiating to, an, um, to a position that the project deals with both our interests as well as profitability. But yes, um, being rigid in regards to our own interest has been at the, uh, at the uh, negative end of, of profitability for ourselves, and those are lessons learned. Again, it's not all fights can be won. So we might have a body of work that just talks to our interests, but we do have what we call bread and butter projects. For the first 10 years of our lives, we did renovations and work for clients. To, you know, we do pro bono work. Um, and that doesn't that affects our bottom line in terms of it takes away time. One very powerful lesson I learned in my entrepreneurial course and which I took towards in you know, that particularly working pro bono work is that someone, my mentor had told me, aren't you more valuable as a practi practicing architect rather than doing work for free? So shouldn't, wouldn't you be a better role model if you had a profitable practice, work that, and once you had built a sustainable growth practice, then did work for free rather than affecting your profitability at the beginning or the beginning of your enterprise? So that balance between doing free work and affecting it needs to be a project by project basis. Yeah. Um, but I, I will also add, um, I obviously completely agree with what Tanzina said, but I think young people going into the job market, the practice market now, are facing quite a lot more challenges, I think, than we did. Um, you're competing with each other, you're competing with uh, difficult economic circumstances, um, the work that we want to do, I mean, they're, they're all public entities um, and all social infrastructure and all of those come with their own kind of baggage in terms of budgets, etc. So all of those things need a balance when, when you are thinking about do I want to make a profit or do I want to make buildings that are socially meaningful? And it takes work to find that balance, and I don't think it's something that happens overnight. So I would also say those things need to be thought about quite carefully about what it is that you're intending to achieve in a way. Um, and it, again, it's it's one of those lessons that we we learned after working for for several years is that there does need to be some planning and some visioning and some kind of bigger picture of how you you want to be a profitable business. Thanks for that. A couple of comments in response to that. Ruby says, sneaky, working your interests into your design. And Heather says, we call it the Trojan horse approach. Um, to let you know, um, just for those of you who want to get CPD points, um, Chenea has posted the CPD points link in the chat. And there is a question that I missed um, earlier on, and it was from, just bear with me, Tobacco. Montebeco, Kumalo, and they said, their, their question was, did you collaborate with engineers? Which I'm sure you did. Um, and if, if so, how did you deal with the back and forth changes in design? Back and forth changes from us or from the engineers? Um, so it's it's uh, working with engineers, and, and I don't mind being land based but it's a necessary evil. We need engineers to make our buildings work and stand up and, and function. 
climatically, etc. So those collaborations are necessary. In fact, we, again, it's part of that building of relationships that we've done over the years. We have engineers we love working with. We have quantity surveyors, et cetera, that we love working with, and they make our projects better. So I think if you're lucky to find people that you have a synergy with and who understand you and you understand them, and they also, what, what's important for me is that they see your authority, they see that you are the lead in the project. Um, it hasn't always been the case uh, where engineers have undermined us to clients. Um, so when we do find good working relationships, we try and maintain them at, at, at all costs. Um, and then the, the back and forth is, is really, is buildings are collaborative efforts. It, you, you design the thing as the process unfolds and there has to be a back and forth. And if you have engineers who you work with really well, the process is actually quite easy. It's when the relationships have friction or when, when someone disregards your authority or your ideas or your expertise, that's when it becomes problematic. Uh, and we have had many of those instances where we had to call someone out and say, I am the team lead. You will have to listen to what I'm asking you to do. And the design has to carry on from there. Um, so it's it's not an easy process, but it, it's part of the job. Just a small comment is that so the early child care center was a collaboration between an, um, uh, with an engineer. We had both won the the the, the, the tender um, and were both being awarded to sh to to work together in order to design the um, to design the ECTC and having um, uh, understood that we were both going to get the tender, we um, were with a deep respect for each other's skills because a larger engineering company, uh, a company with a with an architectural entity, we negotiated to say that we would do the design part of it um, and they would do the engineering part of it and and respect for our specialities. And in that case, it worked quite well. Um, and then the individual size, the design, because it was a typical a typology or a typical thing was placed on the ideal site. And then once it went into construction, we, oh, we split our way and um, implemented it separately. So yes, there are, it's about relationship building. Yeah. Thank you again for that. Um, there's a question that I'm realizing I missed earlier that it's related to procurement and some of the issues we're touching on now. And it's from Wiz. And they ask, being largely a practice whose income is largely public works dependent, what's your view on competitive bidding as a viable way of practice? And what are, what, and what are some of your challenges in that regard? The reality is that the proportion of the number of projects that we tender on, it's probably one in 20 or one oh. in 30 that we, that we win. So, um, so you can imagine the amount of work in order to get the project on viability of it. The key, and it's a risky position to be, as we've learned, uh, because the climate changes. Um, there's a risky position to be in when majority of our work is in the public sector. So my advice to every to anybody is to have a diverse client range so that when part of the economy is up, the other part uh, manages each other. It's a very difficult balance to uh, for us to create because we are at the uh, a, a, you know short end of the economy, so we don't have choice. So we say yes to all work. Um, but at the moment, the ideal balance would be 50-50, public sector, private sector. Mm -hmm. The private sector tend to be more demanding um, and more demanding of your time, um, uh, but as, whereas the pu public sector projects take on so long that even if you thought you were going to be pro profitable in the first set, every external factor affects it, and it projects that were meant to take three years go on to six years and immediately they become not profitable, even if you get them in the first place. So it's a very risky balance and we are the victims of the economy. Um, and uh, yeah, um, it, it's, it's a very risky thing to do. Um, I mean, and, and some of the, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's an industry wide discussion that we, we always feel like it's necessary and we're not sure who the people are who need to be fighting the fight. But doing tenders is incredibly competitive. Um, we're busy with 
five at the moment. And um, somebody we'd spoken to recently had said they'd given a discount of 65% for a major project. I mean, that is not profitable over the long or short term, like Tanzim was saying. Usually these projects for public entities take years to complete. Um, and when they do, you're left with a short end of the stick. You actually end up paying the client. So the risks are many. And it does help to have a balance of, of projects. But when you're in tight economic spots, it does get even more difficult. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to correct the one in 20 to one in 50 <laughs> or even more. Um, it's in the past couple of years, it's been it's been a bloodbath out there, to be honest. Um, we're competing against probably half of the people that are sitting on the panel listening to us tonight. And we all know how each other works and what the pricing are. And, and that's what it comes down to for the client. We spend hours and hours working on methodologies and making sure our documentation is in order and all our cert documents are certified. But ultimately, the client looks at the price and they go, yes, no, and, and don't care about who's getting the job and the quality of work that might come out of that 65% discount. Thank you for that. Um, consolation, I think that the situation you've described is probably world over. Um, but just to, to kind of wrap up, I think we've come to the end of um, the, the session this evening, but it's, it's just so uh, inspiring to see a practice that um, is as formidable as yours and has managed to kind of move ahead break ground in the way that yours has and I think something that also really strikes me as being really impressive is that you also are able to continue to do independent research um, which you casually mention at the end but uh, is really quite an extraordinary achievement to be in this sort of battleground of procurement to sustain a critical and active practice but also to continue research I think it's such a lovely uh, model for, for for me to see and I think for students to see that it is possible. It's not easy, uh, but it's possible. So thanks so much for sharing your practice with us. I know we had a pretty huge turnout this evening, so I know we have an appreciative audience. Um, lots of applause coming through uh, on the Teams interface. And, and um, thank you both very much for, for joining us and for sharing your work with us this evening. And before we sign off, there is a message there from Sarah that I'd just like to read out. And uh, Sarah says, so grateful to have seen this lecture. Lovely to have you with us this evening, Sarah. Thank you for sharing your power. Sorry, I just lost the stop. Thank you for sharing your power in skill and kindness. P.S. The global audience is lucky to have a new view to you and your work. Congratulations and to new brilliant things. I think that's a lovely sentiment to end the evening on. So thank you to everybody for coming. Thank you to... Uh, Althea and Tamsin for sharing your work and we look forward to seeing you join us next week for Kate Otten's presentation. Thank you.